Chapter Twelve of the God of All Comfort. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carol Box. The God of All Comfort by Hannah Whittle Smith. Chapter Twelve: A Word to the Wavering Ones. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. It would be difficult to find any one thing that produces more discomfort in the religious life than does a wavering faith. The figure given us by the Apostle James exactly describes it. A wave of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. And just as it is impossible for a traveller to reach his destination by advancing one day and retracing his steps the next, so is it equally impossible for the wavering soul, while it wavers, to reach any place of settled peace. In our last chapter we considered the shakings of God, and it might be thought that our waverings would be akin to his shakings. But God's shakings are caused by his love, and are for our blessing and always lead to rest and peace while our waverings are caused by our want of faith and always lead to discomfort and turmoil a wavering christian is a christian who trusts in the love of god one day and doubts it the next and who is alternately happy or miserable accordingly he mounts to the hilltop of joy at one time only to descend at another time into the valley of despair he is driven to and fro by every wind of doctrine is always striving and never attaining, and is a prey to each changing influence, caused by his state of health, or by the influences around him, or even by the state of the weather. You would suppose that even the most ignorant child of God would know without telling that this sort of experience is all wrong, and that to waver in one's faith after such a fashion is one of the things most dishonouring to the Lord, whose truth and faithfulness it so impugns. But, as a fact, there are many Christians whose eyes are so blinded in the matter that they actually think this tendency to waver is a tribute to the humility of their spirits, and to exalt every fresh attack of doubt into a secret and most pious virtue. A wavering Christian will say complacently, Oh, but I know myself to be so unworthy that I am sure it is right for me to doubt. And they will imply by their tone of superiority, that their hearer, if truly humble, would doubt also. In fact, I knew one really devoted Christian, whose religious life was one long torment of doubt, who said to me once in solemn earnestness, after I had been urging him to have more faith, My dear friend, if once I should be so presumptuous as to feel sure that God loved me, I should be certain I was on the direct road to hell. He thought, no doubt, that such an assurance could only arise from a feeling that he was good enough to be worthy of God's love, and that to feel this would be presumption. And in this he would have been right, for to think ourselves good enough to be worthy of God's love would be presumption indeed. But the ground for our assurance is not to come from our own goodness, but from the goodness of God. And while we never can be and never ought to be satisfied with the first, there cannot possibly be any question to one who believes the Bible as to the all-sufficiency of the last. To see the absurdity, not to call it by any harsher name, of the position of doubt taken up by this dear Christian, it is only necessary to consider how it would work with any of our human relations in life. Try to imagine what it would be in the marriage relation, or in the relation of children to a parent, both of which relations are used by the Lord as figures of our relation to himself. Suppose either wife or husband should have a wavering experience of confidence in the other, one day trusting and the next day doubting. Would this be considered a sign of true humility on the doubter's part and therefore a thing to be cherished as a virtue? Or similarly, if children should waver in their confidence towards their earthly parents, as Christians seem to feel at liberty to do with their heavenly parent, what name could be found severe enough by which to call such unofficial conduct? Of course, in earthly relations, such wavering might come from the fact that one of the parties concerned was unworthy of confidence, and in this case it could be excused. But in the case of God, 
there could not possibly be any such excuse although the wavering faith of some of his children may i am afraid sometimes lead outsiders to conclude that he cannot be worthy of much confidence or their faith would be more steadfast we would shrink in horror from being the cause of any such imputation on the character of god but i think if we are honest with ourselves we will be forced to acknowledge that our wavering faith is calculated to convey just such an impression and that it really is therefore in its essence disloyalty to a trustworthy god and should be mourned over as a grievous sin the truth is although we may not know it our wavering comes not from humility but from a subtle and often unconscious form of pride true humility accepts the love that is bestowed upon it and the gifts of that love with a meek and happy thankfulness while pride shrinks from accepting gifts and kindnesses and is afraid to believe in the disinterested goodness of the one who bestows them were we truly humble we would accept god's love with thankful meekness and while acknowledging our own unworthiness would only think of it as enhancing his grace and goodness in choosing us as the recipients of such blessings a wavering faith is not only disloyal to god but it is a source of untold misery to ourselves and cannot in any way advance our spiritual interests but must always under all circumstances hinder and upset them the apostle tells us that we are made partakers of christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end to be steadfast is the exact contrary of wavering and to expect the results of steadfastness as the outcome of wavering is as foolish as it would be to expect to reach the top of a mountain by alternately climbing two steps and sliding back three and yet many people expect this very thing they make a beginning of confidence and for a little time while the freshness of it lasts are full of joy and triumph then trials come and temptations and doubts begin to intrude and instead of treating these doubts as enemies to be resisted and driven away they receive them as friends and give them entertainment and sooner or later they begin to waver in their faith and in their allegiance and from that moment all settled peace is gone when skies are bright and all goes well with them their faith revives and they are happy but when skies are dark and things go wrong doubts triumph and they waver again i was having a conversation with a very eminent clergyman on the possibility of a religious life of abiding peace and rest and he told me frankly that he did not believe that it was possible and that he thought most christian experience was like his own now i he said when i want to write my sermons i get up on the mountain top by prayer and by climbing i put my foot first on one promise and then on another and so by hard climbing and much praying i reach the summit and can begin my sermon all goes swimmingly for a little while and then suddenly an interruption comes some trouble with my children or some domestic upset in the house or some quarrel with a neighbour and down i tumble from the mountain top and can only get back again by another wearisome climb sometimes he said i stay on the summit for two or three days and once in a great while even for two or three weeks but as to there being any possibility of being seated in heavenly places in christ and abiding there continually i cannot believe it i am sure this will describe the experience of many of god's children who are hungering and thirsting for the peace and rest christ has promised them but who seem unable to attain it for more than a few moments at a time they may get now and then a faint glimmer of faith and peace seems to be coming and then all the old doubts spring up again with tenfold power look at your heart they say see how cold it is how indifferent how can you for a moment believe that god can love such a poor unworthy creature as you are and it all sounds so reasonable that they are plunged into darkness again the whole trouble arises from a want of faith it seems commonplace to say it for i have to say it so often but in the spiritual life it is to us always 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 according to our faith this is a spiritual law that can neither be neglected nor evaded 
it is not an arbitrary law which we might hope could be repealed in our own especial case but it is inherent in the very nature of things and is therefore unalterable and equally inherent in the nature of things is its converse that if it is to be to us according to our faith so will it also be to us according to our doubts the whole root and cause then of our wavering experience is not as we may have thought our sins but is simply and only our doubts doubts create an impassable gulf between our souls and the lord just as inevitably as they do between us and our earthly friends and no amount of fervour or earnestness can bridge this gulf in one case any more than in the other let not that man that wavereth think that he shall receive anything of the lord this is not because god is angry and visits his displeasure in this way on the man who doubts but it is because of that inherent nature of things that makes it impossible for doubt and confidence to exist together whether in earthly relations or heavenly and which neither god nor man can alter to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest but to them that believed not so we see they could not enter in because of unbelief it was not that god would not allow them to enter in as a punishment for their unbelief but they simply could not it was an impossibility faith is the only door into the kingdom of heaven and there is no other if we will not go in by that door we cannot get in at all for there is no other way god's salvation is not a purchase to be made nor wages to be earned nor a summit to be climbed nor a task to be accomplished but it is simply and only a gift to be accepted and can only be accepted by faith faith is a necessary element in the acceptance of any gift whether earthly or heavenly my friends may put their gifts upon my table or even place them in my lap but unless i believe in their friendliness and honesty of purpose enough to accept these gifts they can never become really mine it is plain therefore that the bible is simply announcing as it always does the nature of things when it declares that according to your faith it shall be unto you and the sooner we settle down to this the better all our wavering comes from the fact that we do not believe in this law we acknowledge of course that it is in the bible but we think it cannot really mean what it says and that there must be some additions made to it for instance as according to our fervency it shall be unto us or according to our importunity or according to our worthiness and if the whole truth were told we are inclined to think that these additions of ours are if anything by far the most important part of the whole matter as a consequence of this our attention is mostly directed to getting these matters settled and we watch our own frames and feelings and search into our own worthiness or unworthiness with so much assiduity that we overlook almost altogether the one fundamental principle of faith without which nothing whatever can be done moreover as our disposition and feelings are the most valuable things in the universe and our sense of worthiness or unworthiness changes with our changing feelings our experience cannot but waver and the possibility of a steadfast faith recedes farther and farther into the background we in short make the faithfulness of god and the truth of his word depend upon the state of our feelings i am very certain that if any of our friends should treat us in this doubting fashion we would be wounded and indignant beyond measure and no feeling of unworthiness on their part could excuse them in our eyes for such a wavering of their confidence in us in fact we would far rather our friends should even sin against us than doubt us no form of sinfulness ever hindered the lord jesus while on earth from doing his mighty works the only thing that hindered him was unbelief in his own town and among his own neighbours and friends where naturally he would have liked to have performed some of his miracles we are told that he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief it was not that he would not but simply that he could not and he cannot in our case any more than in theirs but i am afraid some of you may think i am making a mistake and that in spite of what god has said the man whose faith wavers can after all if he is only fervent and earnest enough 
receive something from the Lord. That means that you do not believe that God understands the laws of his kingdom as well as you yourself do, and that it is safer to follow your own ideas rather than his word. And yet you must know that hitherto your doubts have brought you nothing but darkness and misery. Recall the days and weeks, and even perhaps months and years, of a halting, stumbling, uncomfortable religious life, and ask yourself honestly where to the cause of it all has not been your wavering faith. If you believe one day that God loves you and is favourable to you, and the next day doubt his love, and fear he is angry with you, does it not stand to reason that you must waver in your experience from joy to misery, and that only a steadfast faith in his love and care could give you an unwavering experience? The one question, therefore, for all whose faith wavers, is how to put an end at once and forever to their wavering. And here I am thankful to say that I know of a perfect remedy. The only thing you have to do is to give it up. Your wavering is caused by your doubting, and by nothing else. Give up your doubting, and your wavering will stop. Keep on with your doubting, and your wavering will continue. The whole matter is as simple as daylight, and the choice is in your own hands. Perhaps you may think this is an extreme statement, for it has probably never entered your heads that you could give up doubting altogether. But I assert that you can. You can simply refuse to doubt. You can shut the door against every suggestion of doubt that comes, and can by faith declare exactly the opposite. Your doubt says, God does not forgive my sins. Your faith must say, He does forgive me, He says He does, and I choose to believe Him. I am His forgiven child. And you must assert this steadfastly until all your doubts vanish. You have no more right to say that you are of such a doubting nature that you cannot help doubting, than to say you are of such a thieving nature that you cannot help thieving. One is as easily controlled as the other. You must give up your doubting just as you would give up your thieving. You must treat the temptation to doubt exactly as a drunkard must treat the temptation to drink. You must take a pledge against it. The process I believe to be the most effectual is to lay our doubts, just as we lay our other sins, upon God's altar, and make a total surrender of them. We must give up all liberty to doubt, and must consecrate our power of believing to him, and must trust him to keep us trusting. We must make our faith in his word as inevitable and necessary a thing as is our obedience to his will. We must be as loyal to our heavenly friend as we are to our earthly friends and must refuse to recognize the possibility of such thing as any questioning or doubting of his love or his faithfulness, or of any wavering in our absolute faith in his word. Of course temptations to waver will come, and it will sometimes look to us impossible that the Lord can love such disagreeable, unworthy beings as we feel ourselves to be. But we must turn as deaf an ear to these insinuations against the love of God, as we would to any insinuations against the love of our dearest friend. The fight to do this may sometimes be very severe, and may even at times seem almost unendurable. But our unchanging declaration must continually be, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Our steadfast faith will unfailingly bring us, sooner or later, a glorious victory. Probably, it will often seem to us as if it would be a righteous thing, in view of our many shortcomings, and only what a truly humble soul would do, to waver in our faith and to question whether the salvation of the Lord Jesus can be meant for us. But if we at all understand what the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ is, we cannot fail to recognize that all this is only temptation, and that what we must do is to lift up the shield of faith persistently against it. For the shield of faith always does and always will quench every fiery dart of the enemy. The Spirit of God never under any circumstance could suggest a doubt of the love of God. Wherever doubts come from, one thing is certain, they do not come from heaven. All doubts are from an evil source, and they must always be treated as the suggestions of an enemy. We cannot, it is true, prevent the suggestions of doubt making themselves heard in our hearts, any more than we can prevent our ears from hearing the oaths of wicked men in the streets. But just as we can refuse to approve of or join in the oaths of these men, so can we refuse to pay any attention to these suggestions of doubt. 
the cases are exactly similar but while in the case of the oaths we know without any question that it would be wicked to join in with them in the case of the doubts we have a lurking feeling that after all doubts may have something pious in them and ought to be encouraged but i believe one is as displeasing to god as the other again i would repeat that the only way to treat the doubts that make you waver is to give them up an absolute surrender is the only remedy it is like the drunkard with his drink half measures are of no manner of use total abstinence is the only hope the most practical way of doing this is not only to make the interior surrender but to meet as i have said each doubt with a flat denial and to carry the war into the enemy's country as it were by an emphatic assertion of faith in direct opposition to the doubt for instance if the doubt arises as to whether god can love any one so sinful and unfaithful as you feel yourself to be you must at once assert in definite words in your own heart and if possible aloud to some one that god does love you that he says he does and that his word is a million times more trustworthy than any of your feelings no matter how well founded they may seem to you to be if you cannot find any one to whom to say this then write it in a letter or else say it aloud to yourself and to god be very definite about it if in anything you have had a beginning of confidence if you have ever laid hold of any promise or declaration of the lord's hold on steadfastly to that promise or declaration without wavering let come what may there can be no middle ground if it was true once it is true still for god is unchangeable the only thing that can deprive you of it is your unbelief while you believe you have it whatsoever things ye desire when ye pray believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them let nothing shake your faith should even sin unhappily overtake you you must not let it make you doubt at once on the discovery of any sin take the first letter of john chapter one verse nine and act on it if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness confess your sin therefore immediately upon the discovery of it and believe at once that god does forgive it as he declares and does again cleanse you from all unrighteousness no sin however grievous can separate us from god for one moment after it has been treated in this fashion to allow sin to cause your faith to waver is only to add a new sin to the one already committed return at once to god in the way the bible teaches and let your faith hold steadfastly to his word believe it not because you feel it or see it but because he says it believe it even when it seems to you that you are believing a lie believe it actively and steadfastly through dark and through light through ups and through downs through times of comfort and through times of despair and i can promise you without a fear that your wavering experience will be ended therefore beloved brethren be ye steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the lord for as much as ye know that your labour is not in vain in the lord to be immovable in one's religious life is the exact opposite of wavering in the forty-sixth psalm we can see what it is the earth may be removed and the mountains may be carried into the midst of the sea our whole universe may seem to be in ruins but while we trust in the lord we shall not be moved the man who wavers in his faith is upset by the smallest trifles the man who is steadfast in his faith can look on calmly at the ruin of all his universe to be thus immovable in one's religious life is a boon most ardently to be desired and it may be ours if we will only hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end faith is sweetest of worships to him who so loves his unbearable splendours in darkness to hide and to trust in thy word dearest lord is true love for those prayers are most granted which seem most denied and faith throws her arms around all thou hast told her and able to hold as much more can but grieve she could hold thy grand self lord if thou wouldst reveal it and love makes her long to have more to believe end of chapter twelve